content presented on the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed during this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent views of the Hold Care Network. Always consult your physician for medical and fitness advice and always consult your attorney for legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Hello and welcome to Daughterhood, the podcast. I am your host, Roseanne Corcoran, Daughterhood Circle Leader and Primary Caregiver. Daughterhood is the creation of Anne Tumlinson, who has worked on the front lines in the healthcare field for many years and has seen the multitude of challenges caregivers face. Our mission is to support and build confidence in women who are managing their parents' care. Daughterhood is what happens when we put our lives on hold to take care of our parents. We recognize this care is too much for one person to handle alone. We want to help you see your efforts are not only good enough, they are actually heroic. Our podcast goal is to bring you some insight into navigating the healthcare system, provide resources for you as a caregiver, as well as for you as a person, and help you know that you don't have to endure this on your own. Join me in daughterhood. Ironically, this podcast release date coincides with the one-year anniversary of my beloved mother's death. While we can all acknowledge the emotional aspect of grief, our brains are very much a part of the process. Today, my guest is Dr. Mary Frances O'Connor, author of The Grieving Brain, The Surprising Science of How We Learn from Love and Loss. Dr. O'Connor is also an associate professor of clinical psychology and psychiatry at the University of Arizona and the director of the Grief, Loss, and Social Stress GLASS Lab, where she investigates the effects of grief on the brain and the body. Her research focuses on the physiological correlates of emotion, in particular, the wide range of physical and emotional responses during bereavement, including yearning and isolation. While I wouldn't have been able to absorb this book in my own early grief, it has since brought me a greater understanding and clarity of the process that occurs in our minds and our bodies. And I hope it does the same for you. I hope you enjoy our conversation. No matter how much we think we can prepare ourselves for someone's death, when it actually occurs, all of that goes out the window. So you cover all of this in the book so eloquently and explain it in such relatable ways. But what happens in our brain when we are grieving? Turns out grief is very complex. Just the way you were saying that it's impossible to know what it's going to be like. And one of the earliest things that we discovered when our goal was really just to see what the brain was doing when someone who was grieving was looking at a photo of their loved one in the neuroimaging scanner Even from those very early days, we discovered that there are lots of parts of the brain involved. So it won't surprise you to know there's memory involved, of course, but also perspective taking, um, taking the perspective of the person you're looking at and, and other areas related to emotional pain, but even areas related to things like regulating your heart rate. So from the very beginning, we really were sort of struck by the fact that it's a very complex thing that's going on in your brain. And I don't think people realize that. Yeah. I think because of the processes and because of those lovely five stages of grief everybody talks about, people think, well, it's linear. I'm going to hit all these stages and then I'll be done. And we're done. And I move on with my life. And that's not how it works. It's really not. Yeah. And I think that sometimes the question that I use, which is going to sound strange, but (laughs) is sort of like, when did you get over your wedding day? Right. (laughs) Which is, of course, not a question that even makes sense. No. It's similar, isn't it? So when you lose a loved one, it's not that it it's not that you get over it. It's just that it transforms your life and who you are in the world and how you function. And that's just then true forever. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Right. Even if the intensity of the grief for most people does decline over time. Yeah. It, it's still, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's just a, a change in who you are now. And that's, you know, 
it's interesting because you say that the grieving, you know, is a process. It has a trajectory, but the yeah. grief is always there. Yeah. You are always going to have grief. Yeah. It's just the natural response that we have. And so it can be, you know, 30 years later, it can be however many years later. And if I, you know, uh, so my sister is engaged, for example, and I know that on that day, we are both going to have some tearful moments because our mom isn't there. Right. And right. there's nothing about, we haven't done anything wrong. We didn't miss out on some part of grieving early on. And now it's, you know, erupted. It's not like that. It's just in that moment, you're really aware of, of her absence. And that's how we respond as human beings in that moment, you're still going to have grief. Right. Right. And that's okay. And that's okay. Because over time, hopefully part of what you've learned is sort of, oh, I'm a person who has grief. This is going to overtake me every so often and or maybe often even. And I have a little bit more familiarity with what this wave I'm, you know, being spun in is like, and I know I am going to get through it, even though I wish I didn't have to. And maybe I even have some strategies of maybe how to comfort myself or be kind to myself in that moment. And that's the grieving that over time, we learn how to interact with the fact that we have grief differently. That's fascinating. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. totally. I, well, and you talk about that brain map. Yeah. It's, it's a mental map and yeah. you know where it's like, you, I remember where I put my book. I remember where right. I put my keys. It's the same with people. Yeah. Can you, can you talk about sure. that a little bit? Because that was fascinating to yeah. me. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, right now, if I say to you, where's your daughter? Uh, you, you probably have a relatively good idea of how you would find her and when you're likely to see her next. And because our loved ones, our attachment figures, they are as vital to us as food and water. And, and consequently, the brain has to try and keep track of them because unlike food and water, they do move around, right? right. And so we devote all this space to the where and the when of our loved ones while they're alive. So for your brain, if they're not present in your, in your visual and auditory field, then the simple answer is that you should go get them or you should, you know, attract their attention. So they come to you with the very unusual, thank goodness, circumstance that they die. It's not that they're lost. It's that there is no map. It's that the map has been taken away. And that is very difficult for the brain to understand. It is trying to find them for a long time. Right. And, and you say the here, the now, and the close. Yeah. And so we're trying to find them. Yeah. And that's part of it. And th I think that's part of the, you know, when you, if you leave, yeah. you know, I talk to caregivers when, when they leave the house and then they come home yeah. and they pull in and it's like, oh, they're oh, not gosh. here. Yeah. They're not here. Yeah. And it's, that's all part of the process. That's right. Yeah. Our brain really is a, it's a prediction organ, right? The heart is there to pump blood around your body and the mm -hmm. brain is there really to try and predict what's going to happen next to hopefully give you a little bit extra benefit in trying to cope with whatever's, you know, about to happen. And because of that, we rely on habit a lot, right? Yep. And so it takes a long time for the brain to learn, you know, when I pull into the driveway, you have this automatic response and then you realize, oh, but they're not here anymore because your brain, you know, the prediction machine just plays out the habit of what's supposed to happen. And then there's the realization. And sometimes that happens subconsciously. I think a lot of us sort of feel like grief overtakes us in moments we're not expecting it. Like we weren't doing anything specific. And I think it's partly that the brain is just running these programs. It's just running its habits in the background. And then suddenly it comes into your awareness. Oh, but they're not here. And, and then it feels like it's taken you by surprise uh, because your brain is trying to fulfill these sort of predictions all the time. Right. Like that, like those moments of, oh, I have to call my, yes, oh, not there. that's exactly like, it. And that can, you know, strangely, it hasn't happened recently, but 
I had that with my dad for years, not often, but I would think to call him about something that I had experienced. And it was such a strange, you know, I'm a reasonably bright person. The idea that I couldn't work out, oh, wait, I can't do that before I actually picked up the phone just seemed mysterious to me. But I think it's because the brain is really, it's using all its neurochemicals and connections to try and motivate you to spend time with this person. And that doesn't change right away, even when they're gone. Wow. And that's why with the time heals yeah. comes yeah. in. It's not necessarily the time. It's that our brains need to catch up yes. and it just takes the, it just takes the, the circuitry that long it to does. reestablish. And you know, it, well, it's something related to time, I think, which is experience, right? right? So you can't have experience without time, but time is not sufficient, right? And so you have all these experiences of, you know, I, I said in the book, you, you do the laundry, you know, four times in a month and you didn't put your husband's socks away. And that is information for your brain, right? It isn't, we don't think of that traditionally as sort of grieving per se, but your brain is having new experiences and that all gets fed into this information system of what is happening in the world? How do I operate in the world and what's going to happen next? It's fascinating when you think about it that way, yeah. because I think we're we're so tied into our emotions yeah. and the emotion feelings. And then when you think that your brain actually is having to rewire itself. Yeah. Yeah. Like it it actually doesn't compute. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that this person isn't here. That's right. And you know, I talk about the perspective of the brain a lot because I think it is a really it is a different lens and anything that can give us a new way of thinking about something as old and universal as grief, if that can help us think about it in some way, then that's great. When I say the brain, your brain is doing this, it isn't that your brain isn't part of you, of course. I don't mean it that, you know, there's some little man living up there in your head. Um, but, right. but often a lot of what the brain is doing is automatic or subconscious. And so it is trying to sort of solve problems without bothering you, you know, <laughs> without sending all of those thoughts to consciousness. And so when I talk about your brain is doing this or that, and your brain is sort of on your side, it's not that it's separate from you, but really that it's just, it's doing a lot in the background. Well, and it's the that counterfactual thinking too uh, yes. that you talk mm -hmm. about. Our, if I would have done this sooner, yeah. if I could have, and caregivers do that in oh, you know, it's kind of built absolutely. in the coulda, shoulda, wouldas. Yeah, because we're in charge. Right, right. So being in charge means well, I can save this That's person, right. and it, I must have done something wrong yeah. if they died. Yeah, yeah. And this is one of those places where I think you know, science and, and even sort of philosophy, the logic part of philosophy can help us a little bit because the brain can kind of get in the way as well, because we have these ways of thinking. And if we don't look at them closely, they sometimes lead us down the wrong path. Just like you were saying, that sort of should have, would have, could have all of those stories, you know, I should have known that this medication would do that. Or I, I could have taken her to the doctor sooner, you know, Yes. All of those stories that you're running out in your head, they actually all end with, and then my loved one didn't die. And the reality is they did die. And so living in that sort of virtual world, not that you're doing it intentionally, but living in those would have, should have, could have mean you're, means you're not actually having the experience of being in the present moment in your life now with all its pain and sorrow but also its connection and its silliness and pride and all the good things too. Right. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard Yeah. because to try to make that disconnect yeah. and then try to move forward in that. Yeah. And you, you, you speak of the pushing thoughts away mm -hmm. and how you push these thoughts away, but they come back. Yeah. And it's almost like they come back with an army. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they come back twice as much. Mm -hmm. What is that? What is that? phenomena. Yeah, this is very, there's some really interesting work on this, some neuroimaging work. 
done by Noam Schneck at Columbia University. And I won't go into the nitty gritty details because it's quite technical, but the upshot of it is think about it this way. If you're trying not to think about your loved one who's died or even just the idea of death, your brain has to monitor to figure out if you're thinking about it so you can avoid thinking about it. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. And right. So right. you're actually then monitoring again, perhaps on a sort of automatic, maybe subconscious level, but because you're monitoring for it, that person is actually very much in part of your head and almost more so than if you weren't trying to avoid. I have had a number of grieving people say to me, once I just sort of accepted that this was going to happen, it was actually kind of easier than avoiding it all the time. Right. Because I feel like if you're trying to avoid it, you're simply just you're just making your process longer because you can't outrun that. Yeah. And, you know, I will say your brain and your body needs a break at times when you're grieving, right? Like right. it's doing <laughs> a lot for you. And so it's not that there's never a moment that avoidance isn't appropriate, right? So you're right. at some award ceremony for your sibling, you know, and, and you're like, you know what, I'm just going to pretend this hasn't happened. I'm just going to focus on what's going on right now. I'm going to put it out of my head if it comes into my head and focus on celebrating my sister. That's fine. That's really good because it's appropriate to the situation, to the life you're living right now. Avoidance is okay in those, in those ways. But if avoidance is keeping you from experiencing what life is like for you now, and life for you now contains grief, then it takes more time, right? For your brain to understand how life works now and, and how to restore it to something meaningful for you. Right. It's, it's so interesting to me how our thought patterns can either help or, or hinder our grieving process. Yeah. Because you also talk about ruminating. Yeah. Ruminating, what's positive, what's negative. Yeah. The passive or the active-ness yeah. of that. Yeah. And again, I, I feel like it gets trapped in that I don't want to think about this. I don't want to yeah. deal with this. I don't want to be in this position. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But how is that? It, it's, I think that's the, the dual, is that the dual mm. process mode? Yeah. The dual process mode of this mm. part of bereavement. Yeah. yeah. I, I sometimes think because people have the opposite as well. Sometimes they are ruminating about how they feel all the time. And that takes the form of like, am I normal? Am I having too much? Right. Is this too much grief? Am I, right. is this crazy? Right. And why right. do my friends all think I'm crazy? And, and ironically, that also is really so focused on kind of the, there's no answer to, am I grieving normally? Cause there's no normal. And so spending a lot of time worried about whether you're grieving normally actually, again, takes you out of whatever it is that's going on around you and with you. So you're right. Rumination can have several different flavors or several different topics. Um, but the dual process model, like you said, you know, this was really kind of a, a reaction to sort of the five stages model that we, you know, stuck with for quite some time, which we know now isn't a linear sort of, you know, you step through the process one stage at a time. The real, you know, interesting thing about the dual process model, the dual part means grieving people have to deal with sort of loss related stressors. And that's typically what we think of as grief, sort of those emotions and those thoughts. And how do I, how do I make sense of this? But Grieving people also have to handle, have to face what are called restoration stressors, right? So if I was going to retire with my wife and, you know, we've been planning this for years and years and she dies, how am I going to live through that period of time in a meaningful way? Or even really simple things like, you know, I've never done the taxes before. Now suddenly it's on me. I have to figure out how to do this. So all those restoration stressors are also things that people are having to do, grieving people are having to deal with. I think the genius of the model, though, is that um, Strobel and Schutt really brought up this idea of oscillation. So we are sort of constantly going back and forth between focusing on loss and focusing on restoring our life. And 
that flexibility, I think, is the sign of mental health, right? Yeah. Not that you're not going to face stressors, not that you're not going to have to come up with coping strategies, but rather the flexibility of, okay, what am I dealing with today? What am I dealing with right now? And what's a way that I can sort of address that situation I'm in? And allowing yourself to be in that. Yeah. Not being in only one or only the other, right? Yes. Yes. Or, well, that was yesterday yeah. and today is different. Yeah, absolutely. That's a big one. So the it's it's the flexibility that goes with that. Yeah. But also the compassion yes. for yourself. Ah, uh, yes. Of being where you are. That is so well put that you're going to have lots of different experiences, lots of different feelings, feelings you really don't want to have, probably like guilt or blame or um relief, right? These are not things you're supposed to feel during grief necessarily. Um, and you know what you do, we don't get to determine that we don't get to pick how our grief is going to feel. We do get some level of how we respond to those feelings, but the feelings themselves are just, they're just going to happen. Right. Right. Well, and as part of the restoration that you were speaking of, what, when does it get to the point of being not healthy mm. for the people that that say i i'm never going to be happy again yeah yeah you know people will have lots of different experiences and so i think what's challenging is you know i sometimes say i, I might be an expert on grief on average or the patterns of grief but you're the expert on your grief you're the one who knows what your process is and should be and looks like and so forth but I have this different perspective because, you know, as an individual, grief is often the worst you have ever felt, right? So in your lived experience, this is the worst. And at the same time, as I look at a whole, you know, host of people who are grieving, I can also see that some of them are functioning in their lives, right? They're still getting dinner on the table. They're still going out grocery shopping, even if their shoes don't match, right? They're still, right, right. they're still doing, you know, they're still right. doing things and they have moments of um, telling, you know, a funny story about what their loved one did and sort of having some pride in maybe how they cared for their loved one. And, you know, so there's, uh, there's that even when that grief for that person is the worst they felt, right? So right, right. it then becomes, I think, at times helpful to think about, well, who are the people that clinicians or researchers get concerned about? And those are the ones at that far end of the spectrum who don't really seem to be able to restore a life for themselves. And so we hear things like, you know, I feel like I'm just going through the motions. Right. right. So you may be mm -hmm. even you may even be getting out the door and going grocery shopping, but it has no enjoyment for you whatsoever. Um, right. Or we hear, you know, I had a woman tell me, you know, why would I give my children bat mitzvahs if their grandmother isn't there to see it? So you can see that it isn't even just impacting her, it's impacting the whole family that she's not really able to engage in her life in a way that that she might want to, or her family may, may want her to. So in those cases, and often we call that, uh, currently we call that the prolonged grief disorder. Right. What's, what's remarkable about having identified what some of those experiences are is now that there are therapies that are targeted for that that can be very effective for people. Even if they felt that way for a decade, it turns out these people still often benefit from this type of targeted psychotherapy. And is that a, is that just... The wiring, and I know that you get into this a lot in the book, is it just the wiring, how, how our brains are wired, or is it something that we can try to help ourselves with? Mm. So the brain is very plastic, it turns out. The brain is constantly <laughs> changing its neural connections and its levels of neurochemistry and, and so forth. So our 
our brain is very rarely stuck in just one possibility, but it does often take things like the courage to try new things in order to build new wiring in the brain. For people who that just doesn't seem possible, it is sometimes the case that being in a psychotherapy relationship can give you the courage, the sort of motivation maybe to try new things. So in psychotherapy, it isn't necessarily that we're trying to get rid of the grief. It's more that, you know, the grief has gotten kind of derailed. So Grieving is a natural process and our brains and bodies sort of know how to do that, kind of like giving birth, right? It, but it often helps to have people around who know what's going on when, when someone's having a baby, right? right. And this mm -hmm. is in sort of a similar way. The therapist may be able to say, you know, this is kind of a common derailer that we see what you're, what you're describing right now. And we have some, you know, maybe some other ways to think about it or things you might try, um, even though they might sound a little nuts at first, um, to, in order to have new experiences and develop new understandings of how you can be in the world. No, that's great. And I often wonder if that's why they say don't make any big decisions mm -hmm. in the first year after someone dies, because your brain is literally trying to readjust yeah. everything. Yeah. Is that why? I, I think that is why that in that acute grief place that we're in, where we know that, you know, our hormone levels have changed probably and our, um, our blood pressure is probably a little bit higher than it was before, that that means that if we're making long-term decisions, we're probably not the person we will be in six months or a year. And so if we make decisions then that are going to affect, you know, future self, um, they may not actually be the right ones for future self because of how you're feeling at the moment. But I also, I, you know, I don't think that's a hard and fast rule necessarily. I think it depends on the circumstance that people are in. I think it's always worth considering is this, you know, do my friends who love me and know me really well, do they also think that this is a decision that will serve future, future Mary Frances, right? Um, right, right, right. <laughs> because they know you, they love you, they care about you. They may not have all the answers, but it is worth considering their perspective. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. That's great. Question. Is there grief brain? Because I have to tell you, there are times I'm like, wait, what was I just, I was just thinking mm. and then it's gone. If I don't write it down, yeah. forget yeah. it. And I try to think, I think it's grief mm. brain. Is grief brain a thing or am I just trying to make myself feel better? <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> so what we know from research from very, very large samples now, sort of thousands of people even, is that when you do sort of very careful, what we would call neuropsychological testing, so testing your memory, testing your processing speed, testing um, the, those sorts of cognitive functions, for people who are grieving typically, for people who are fairly resilient, we actually don't see declines in their um, long-term cognitive functioning. We do see changes in attention, for example, uh, and especially early on. And I think some of this is your brain is doing so much work in the background to even figure out how do I do the things that should be habits, but clearly that's not working. So right. I think, you know, having your attention taken away from what you're currently doing makes it very hard then to encode whatever it is, you know, the person just told you a phone number or whatever, um, yeah. you know, you're because of that. So I think there can be many reasons for what we call grief brain. Certainly grief is one of them, but of course, grief often happens during menopause or grief also happens when people are doing chemo or, you know, there's all sorts of other reasons as well that can impact our ability to concentrate. Um, so I wouldn't, I would never say that it's probably only uh, something called grief brain, but that experience of not being able to concentrate is so common. Okay. Well, that's a plus. Yeah. Yes, you're not nuts. I'll exhale a little yeah. bit because, you know, it's it's frightening. Yeah. <laughs> I had a, when my, my father was uh, elderly, his physician was just a wonderful man. And my father had this worry that he was losing his mind. And, and this doctor said to him, you know, Bill, he said, if you can't remember where you put the remote, 
that's totally normal. If you pick up the remote and you don't know what it's for, that's a problem. <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> so and it's that, all kind of on a the spectrum, truth. right? <laughs> it's hard too, because I think, and this is, you know, this is a societal problem as many things are. Mm -hmm. It's almost looked at as this journey mm -hmm. that you take on this journey and you come, it's a hero's journey, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's a monomyth. You come out, it's, you know, you have a problem and then you overcome it and look at me. Now I can say, I feel like after, after being an in-home dementia caregiver, yeah. I feel like I can do anything. Yeah. Nothing. Right. It's like, whatever. Is that all you have? Right. Cause, Cause I I've just did it. this. Yeah. Yes. I don't know if in the grief mode, because you, we don't know how long it takes sure. to process everything. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that kind of thinking sets us up for defeat almost. Yeah. Like I'm not doing this right, exactly. or I don't feel good about yeah. this. Therefore I'm not. Yeah, yeah, I do know. And I sometimes liken it because I think it's not that it's not that we don't know how long grief takes. It's that that's not an, an accurate question, right? So I right. think of this as an analogy too. Most of us leave the nest at some point in our late adolescence or young adulthood, but leaving the nest actually takes quite a bit of time, right? So you might move into a dorm or you might go on a mission or you might um, be in the military or, you know, so it's really actually quite a while before you're, you know, dealing with your own taxes and um, making right. grocery lists and <laughs> figuring out what health insurance means and, right, like it's a long time yeah. for us to really leave the nest. And I think this is similar. You know, we don't ask each other, so have you, have you finished leaving the nest yet? Right? Like, that's not a question. Right. You might ask, right. hey, how's it going with living with roommates? That seems really new. And that's, there's a lot of trouble with that. How's it going? Right? But we wouldn't right. say, you know, are you done figuring out how to live with roommates? You know what I mean? <laughs> I do. Uh, yes. You're right. But I, I think, and that's the the expectation. Yeah. And the myth, right? That there's going to be some in the end. Myth. Yeah. There, there's going to be like streamers are going to yeah. go and there's going to be fireworks like, Hey, you're, you're done. done. You can go back the way you exactly. were. And it's like, there's no before times. There is no before no. times. Cause that person kind of left yeah. and, and evolved. Yes, and, and that's right. Because now you carry the absence of this person. The before you yes. didn't, carry the absence of a person that didn't even know what that felt like. Right. So right. you're a new person. Yes. And no one likes change. No, no, <laughs> no one likes change. No. And this is a complete and total change yeah. and rearrangement. Yes. Yes. Many people talk about how <laughs> their, their address book completely changes. Right. So, or we might say our contact list now, I guess. <laughs> it's all right. It's okay. We can keep it old school. That's right. Um, <laughs> and I think some of that is you do become a somewhat different person because you carry this experience, because you carry the absence of this person with you. And it can be really hard to relate when people don't understand your experience or the way you've reacted to your experience. And that's maybe okay, right? Relationships do evolve and sometimes fade into the background and others sort of emerge as being, you know, man, I never thought this person would be, become such a good friend, would be so supportive, but they really get it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And that's a plus. It is. It is. And then very sad when, you know, some of our friends turn out to be family members too. And so right. when, when you're, yeah. you're sort of dealing with this person doesn't really understand what I'm going through. Um, and they're also a family member. You, you may still have to interact with them. Um, but that relationship is likely to evolve in one direction or another. Right. And that's okay also yeah. because this isn't a group project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Everybody doesn't have to agree that's right. on how you respond to this. That's right. Yeah. And maybe that gives us a little bit of compassion for how other people are responding, right? Exactly. One of the things I really like about that dual process with the loss stressors on one side and the restoration stressors on the other is that the way people react looks really different, even if they lost the same person right? So totally. my sister and I might react totally differently and 
and express our grief in totally different ways, even though we both lost our mother, right? Yes. Uh, I think the idea that the expression of grief looks really different across cultures, across periods of history, and even, you know, between individuals, it doesn't necessarily mean that the experience of grief is so very different, although that can be true as well. Um, But sort of giving people the benefit of the doubt, this person is doing the best that they can. And this person is reacting to a loss in this particular way doesn't mean anything about the way I'm reacting just because they're doing it differently. Right. Well, and and it's, you know, I, I think especially with caregiving, yeah. if you were the hands-on caregiver, yeah. I believe it's different. Yeah. I believe it's totally different yeah. because your entire day, mm-hmm. your entire process, yeah. your entire being yeah. was entwined up. Yeah. with that person yes. that you were caring for. And I, I don't mean this as a scale of, no. well, my grief's bigger than your grief. That's not what I'm saying. Nope. I, I would never say such a thing. But I think for those of us that did have that experience, it's different. It's different. And, you know, I think maybe this is a helpful example. So when my mom, when my, when my father was very elderly, he really wanted to stay in our little tiny hometown that we had grown up in. My sister lived, you know, on the East coast and I lived in Tucson, Arizona and we offered, but he didn't want to come live with us. And I frankly understood why. And There was a very close family friend lived a couple doors down and she provided a lot of hands-on caregiving for for our father to our eternal gratitude. And we would alternate visiting very, very regularly, but it's not the same. It's just not. And, you know, after he died, she would say, I keep looking out my kitchen window to see if your dad's light is on, right? Because that was how she knew when he'd gone to bed. Or she would say, you know, we always went on Tuesdays to get his blood drawn. And and Tuesday comes and we don't do that. And I thought, you know, she is having a different experience than I am, a profound experience. He wasn't her father, but she was the one whose life was bound up in the moment to moment, day to day, hands on caregiving. Yes. Yeah. And it's it's different. Yeah. Because everything, your entire everything yeah. blew up. Yeah. It's just gone. It's gone. And now you have to figure out how to restore your own life and move forward without both the person and the schedule that went with that person. And the purpose sometimes, right? And the purpose. Absolutely. Because now what am I supposed to do Who am I? Who am I if Mm -hmm. I'm not a caregiver? That's right. That's right. You know, those words actually, it's so interesting if you think about it, the word caregiver We use that, of course, to describe you, right? Mm -hmm. Roseanne, caregiver. But the Mm -hmm. word caregiver implies two people, right? Okay. Well, yeah, I guess it does. Because, right, you can't be a caregiver without there being another person. And it turns out a lot of words actually are like that. So the word daughter implies two people. Right. The word spouse implies two people, even though we use it to describe an individual. So what that means is you have to learn how to be in the world with an identity that doesn't match what what your experience is. I'm a caregiver, but I can't live in the world as a caregiver because there's no other person. Or I'm a daughter, but I don't know how to be a good daughter when there's no mom, you know? Right. Wow. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's about you yes. too. Yeah. Well, and that's that's it. Yeah. And and it's not a we anymore. Right. It's a me. Right. Yes. That's exactly so it. Here I am. Yeah. And now and what, do what do you do? What do I do with that? What do I do with that? Yeah. Well, that's different. Yeah. And that's and scary. And scary. And you you go so long yeah. not thinking about yourself. Exactly. And just plugging along because yep. as, you know, you're going, you're going, you're going. Yep. And now it's like, okay, your turn. Yeah. Your spotlight's on you. What are you going to do? How do yeah. you do this? It's, you know, paralyzing, I think, for a lot of people. It is. And it's it's trying to start over while those, yeah. while every day. And it's it's every minute of the day. Exactly. And the night. <laughs> and the night. And the night. Yeah. And it's interesting that you said about people 
while they're grieving not to not to take sleeping pills. Yeah. I've never and it makes sense to me because that's not the issue. Yeah. Again, it's not a problem to be solved. Yeah. It's not a a, a a a disease to be treated. Yeah. You're grieving. Yeah. And there are there are triggers. What it, what did you it's a, a Zeitgebers. Zeit, Zeit, <laughs> yes. Isn't that a great word? I was like, wow, what is that? Yeah. And but it makes perfect sense. Can you talk yeah, about yeah, that a little sure. bit? So Zeitgebers, it is this German word, but it, it it literally means time givers. So it turns out that the human circadian cycle is something like 23 and a half hours, which you okay. know we live on a 24 hour planet. And so we always have the potential of being a little out of sync. But part of the reason that we're not out of sync is because we have all these reminders that put our circadian cycle back in rhythm. So, you know, you get up in the morning, you open the curtains, you drink the coffee, you you walk outside and get the newspaper, right? Mm -hmm. Um, At night, you probably, you know, have a period of quiet, you know, whether that's TV or book or something, you brush your teeth, your husband gets into bed, and then you you know, check the dog and then you, right. So these are the things that are just very habit formed and they help your brain to realize, oh, we're going to bed now. It's time to go to sleep. Well, if many of those have been disrupted because there isn't the person there who was the other half of all those habits, then it's very confusing for your brain. And that circadian rhythm isn't quite right for for a while. But here's the problem. If you still try to maintain a good rhythm, and, and most easily that is getting up at the same time every day, because you can't make yourself go to sleep, it turns out. No, no, you <laughs> but, can't. <laughs> but you can, for the most part, make yourself get out of bed, right? right and so right. if you essentially are restoring a life that has new sight givers in it, you may not even know what those are going to be yet, but you are restoring a life that will enable good sleep eventually. The trouble with introducing something like medication is that becomes one of the sight givers right? Right. And so then it's very difficult to have to go through that adjustment process again without the medication that has become the feeling of, oh, I took the pill. I feel this way. I'm going to go to sleep. So that's why we encourage people not to as difficult as it can be. Um, And there are good sleep medicine specialists, if people are really struggling, who can do behavioral intervention to really help with that process. That's amazing because, you know, nighttime is not a caregiver's friend. Who knew? And, you know, it, you know, runs the gamut. Yeah. I'm still not sleeping right. Yeah. Because my mother was up all night. Yeah. And I'm trying to just go with it. Like, well, of course you have to get used to it. You have to get used to it. But after I read that about Mm. you can control what time you wake up. Yeah. I've been trying to do that. And that seems to to have made a big difference. So thank you very much for that. (laughs) I'm so glad. It's such an important, this is one of those things where understanding the brain kind of helps, right? Well, that's, that's it. You have a a thing in your brain that runs 23 and a half hours, it turns out, and you can help to encourage it to run on the right 24 hour cycle. Well, yes. And that's, that's also, I feel like in the after we're, yeah. we're so used to caring. You're just going, you're just going yep. and you don't even know, you can't even, you don't even check in with your body half the time. No. So you don't no. even know. And then that's gone and right. your brain's rewiring and your body's like, what are we doing? And yeah. it's like, you just have to give yourself that space and that yeah. compassion to be yeah. flexible. That's right. That's and right. It will work itself out. That's right. And and to try the flexibility of trying different things. I know that after my dad died in the late evening, I would feel very panicky, honestly. Right. I would have all this sort of restless energy and and genuinely feeling, you know, my heart rate would speed up and and I decided to start going for walks really late at night. Um, I have a very safe neighborhood, thank goodness. Um, And I would walk really fast out in the neighborhood at night because it kind of matched how I felt. Yes. And then by the time I got home, I'd be kind of a little bit exhausted from it. I probably cried too on the walk, let's be honest. No doubt. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, Mm -hmm. And then somehow the idea of sleep didn't seem quite so foreign. So, But walking at night was never something I had ever done in my 
life. Right. So I was trying to sort of react to the way I was, you know, I was trying to match whatever my reaction was with some possible flexible, you know, way of coping while also trying to think, okay, how can this fit into, you know, an approximately eight hours of sleep? Yeah. No, that's brilliant. Well, mm. what type do you have tips mm. Mm. for that restorative time? Like, mm-hmm. okay, this is what's happening. So maybe we can do this. Or I can't seem to get past my grief. Mm-hmm. What can I try to, yeah. to help myself? I think there are probably two big ones, maybe three. One is really asking yourself, what am I avoiding? That's a real, like, Oof. you have to be honest. With, I know, right? That's a Who bomb. That? Yeah. You don't have to tell anyone. You just have okay. to be honest with yourself, okay. right? You can journally answer. Exactly. Yeah. Because okay. often what we're avoiding, maybe it's a, a place, maybe it's a conversation, maybe it's a person, but maybe it's an activity, right? Like, um, I, I can't go to this restaurant anymore, even though I love this restaurant and everybody right. knows me there. I can't right. go there anymore. Or I couldn't possibly take a trip by myself, right? That's just, that I don't do that. So I think if you can be kind of honest with yourself about what you were avoiding and then find a way to try and try and do it, whether that takes support from other people. Okay. So I'm trying this thing. I really need your support right. or breaking it into smaller steps, right? Okay. So I can't take a road trip yet. That's, uh, that feels by myself. That's ridiculous. That's impossible. Right. But maybe I could go for a long trip through the city to a museum. I haven't done that either. So I'm driving for a long time. Okay. So that actually, I, I managed that. It wasn't perfect, but I managed that. Right. So sort of building up to it. Gotcha. That's one set of things that I think can help in the longer term when you feel like you're still stuck. Um, because you learn new things about yourself, about how you act in the world, about the world. Um, the other one is kind of related, but I think we need positive activities in our life. And here's the funny thing. It's a little bit like getting good, uh, creating the right good conditions for sleep. So even if you think I'm not going to enjoy going to this dinner, or I'm not going to enjoy uh, going to the movie with this friend. It doesn't exactly matter whether you enjoy it or not. You're trying to get into a habit of doing things that are typically entertaining or social or enjoyable or meaningful or fun or silly or, you know, whatever, Mm -hmm. um, to get yourself a little bit into the habit so that surprise in some moment, while you are there, you may have an experience of joy or love or silliness. Uh, And and if you're not there, it's not going to happen. So even though, you know, I think we try to predict like, well, but I'm not going to enjoy it. So why would I bother going? It's more like if you go, it could happen, stay open to the possibility and build that, that habit back into your life. That's fascinating. Okay. And it's, I think also, I I don't know if people realize if you're numbing one section of your life, you're numbing all of your life. That's the thing. Research suggests that we can't just block the negative emotions. So if we're really trying to avoid pain or sorrow, you're also, you're just going to be numb. So you're not going to feel connection or pride or joy either because you've just blocked the channel, period. And the being in the present, not yeah. in the past mm-hmm. and not in the future, yeah. but being simply in the present kind yeah. of, well, obviously it grounds you, but it brings you here to look yeah. forward. And yeah. I, I've read that and I was fascinated by that. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that in, in trying to stay here yeah. and not, not awfulizing in in the future, but trying to make a plan for yourself in the future. Yeah. I think if you're in the present moment, and that literally means sort of looking around at what's around you and, you know, really, am I listening to that person I'm in the room with those sorts of things? It really can help you to understand, oh, when I do this, I do actually feel interested that's not a feeling I've had before uh, or I haven't had in a long time. Right. But it's only going to happen if you're kind of 
present and paying attention to being in the present. And sometimes then you may have the experience, oh, huh, I feel interested in this. Maybe this is something I should do again, right? Then you're maybe able to plan a little bit for the future. That's very interesting. In The Grieving Brain, you wrote that you hoped that neuroscience could help you understand and predict who adjusts resiliently following the death of a loved one and who struggles to restore a meaningful life. Do you find that it helped you with that? We are still in very early days, I will be honest with you, but I think we've come to understand that grief is a lot about the bond that we have. So when you bond with a loved one, when you fall in love with your baby or with your spouse, that bond is encoded in your brain and I think, and is very rewarding, right? I think we're coming to understand now that grief has a lot to do with what happens when that reward goes away. How does the brain change its uh, understanding of the world when that rewarding bond isn't there in a way that we didn't understand before we were looking in the brain. Yeah. Any final thought or message to those who are grieving? You know, I think I would say try to listen to these things, but really only apply the things that work for your life. These aren't advice. They're just maybe, you know, a menu of possibilities and and really, you know yourself best. So apply those the way that works for you. A big thank you to Mary Frances O'Connor for being my guest. Her book, The Grieving Brain, The Surprising Science of How We Learn from Love and Loss, is available anywhere books are sold, including Amazon and Barnes & Noble, and on Audible and Kindle as well. For more information about her and her research, check out our website, maryfrancisoconnor.com. I hope you enjoyed our podcast today. Head over to daughterhood.org and click on the podcast section for show notes, including the full transcript and links to any resources and information from today's episode. You can find and review us on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you listen to your podcasts. We are also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Daughterhood the Podcast, and on my blog, heyrow.com. Feel free to leave me a message and let me know what issues you may be facing and would like to hear more about, or even if you just want to say hi, I'd love to hear from you. Also, a very special thank you to Susan Rowe for our theme music, the instrumental version of her beautiful song, Mama's Eyes, from her album, Lessons in Love. I hope you found what you were looking for today, information, inspiration, or even just a little company. This is Roseanne Corcoran. I hope you'll join me next time in Daughterhood.